Hi everyone, good to see you again. Uh, good to see you back again. I'm glad that you've joined with us again today. You're all, as always, you're all very, very welcome. And today uh, we're going to look at a subject which, you know, whether it jumps uh, into your mind immediately or not, it's actually going to be one of your favourite subjects. And it's the subject of God's grace. And it's it's, it's our favourite subject because without it, we wouldn't be here. Um, without it, we wouldn't be forgiven. Without it, we would not be saved. Without it, oh, listen, without it, we wouldn't be kept. We wouldn't be sustained. Without it, we wouldn't be a child of God. But listen, before we begin today, I just want to take a minute. and It's a minute to, to pay tribute to... Um, to a man who some of you may have known, a man called James Bell. Now, James was called home to be with his saviour on just Monday past. And James was a, a humble but gifted and, and what's more, he was a very anointed man who just delighted to share and to serve his saviour. And he was a man who knew God's grace in his life. He walked in God's grace. He lived in it. He breathed in it each and every day. And James was a, a musician, he was a singer and a songwriter. So let's watch and let's listen now to James as he sings a very simple yet intensely personal deep testimony of his relationship with God and the reality of God's love and God's grace in his life. Don't know why he loves me Don't know why he cares Don't know why he loves me But he's always there He just loves me Yes, he loves me and This I know I know he loves me I know he cares I know he loves me He's always there He just loves me Yes, he loves me And no matter what I say And no matter what I Yes, he loves me And this I know He told me so I know he loves me I know he cares I know he loves me In Calvary, but he loves me. Yes, he loves me. And this I know. He told me so. I know he loves me. I know. 
I know he loves me He's always there He just loves me Yes, he loves me And no matter what I've done He loves me like a son He just loves me Yes, he loves me This I know This I know This I know He told me so Thank God for James and his life. And today we think and we pray for his family as they mourn the loss of James. May they know God's comfort and strength. And in the midst of their grief, may they rejoice in the sure knowledge that James is now eternally healed. And he's in the presence of the Saviour he loved so much. As I said, James knew God's grace in his life and God's grace is what we are looking at today. But here's the thing. And you can think about this yourself as I'm saying it. Often, too often, when we think of God's grace, you know, in our minds, we, we, we tend to be in the New Testament, really, in in the New Covenant. It's as if somehow... God's grace is linked to the cross, which it is actually, by the way. But what I mean by that is that somehow God's grace um, only really began to flow to, to his creation, to us, sort of through and after the cross, after Calvary, through the, the new covenant. And I guess, you know, that kind of fits in with, with, with a common kind of worldly conception of God in the Old Testament, you know that in the Old Testament he's angry, he's vengeful, he's a punitive God. Whereas in the New Testament, you know, with, with the New Covenant, um, God personified and revealed in Jesus, he, he's the softer, more forgiving God, a more merciful God somehow. Full of grace in the New Testament, you know. But a concept like that, it's entirely wrong. God is God. The God we see uh, revealed in Jesus is exactly the same God of the Old Testament. There's nothing new about him. There never will be anything new about him. And nothing has changed or ever will. Can we read from the Old Testament now, please? We're going we're gonna to read about a man called Manasseh. Okay, Manasseh. In the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 21. And as always... Uh, I'll, I'll just pause for a wee second or two here to give you a chance uh, to find it if you want to kind of read along with us. 2 Kings chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. Let's read together. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hethzibah, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the despicable uh, practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed, and he erected altars for Baal, and made an Asherah as Ahab king of Israel had done, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built, built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his son as an offering, and used fortune-telling and omens, and dealt with mediums, and necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. 
and the carved image of Asherah that he made, he set in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever, and I will not cause the feet of Israel to wander any more out of the land that I gave to their fathers. If only they will be careful to do according to all that I have commanded them, it was conditional, and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not listen, and Manasseh led them astray to do more evil than the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. Verse 10. And the Lord said by his servants the prophets, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these abominations and has done things more evil than, than, than all that the Amorites did who were before him, and has made Judah also to sin with his idols, therefore thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of anyone who hears of it will tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plumb line of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of my heritage and give them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies because they have done what is evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, besides the sin that he made Judah to sin, so that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and the sin that he committed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Manasseh slept with his fathers and was buried in the garden of his house, in the garden of Uzzah. And Ammon, his son, reigned in his place. So there we have the story of Manasseh. All round nice guy, yeah? <laughs> but I, I kind of at first glance, as we read through that passage, you might think to yourself, and it, well, that kind of just fits in nicely with this sort of Old Testament kind of vengeful God concept. He's got angry and he's took revenge. You know, verse 12, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of anyone who hears of it will tingle. Verse 13, God will wipe Jerusalem clean. But is this really the case here? We need to have a look at what's going on first. And I don't want to go too much into the whole, whole background uh, of this passage today, but... But it, well, I want to focus on God and I want to focus on Manasseh and God's dealings with Manasseh. But we, we do need to set it in context. So the, the books of uh, first, or first and Second Kings, well, there's going to be no prizes for guessing what they're actually about, is there really? Um, the title's given away. The title suggests that they are a record of the kings um, of Israel and of Judah. Uh, one Kings begins at the end of end of David's reign, and it goes through the the dividing of the kingdom uh, into Israel in the north and Judah in the south uh, under different kings and, and and onwards. And we read through as we read through First and, and Second Kings with each king. You know, we're usually kind of given a sort of a brief summary of their reign, and often near the beginning of that summary, as we heard here. You're going to read uh, either he did what was right um, in the sight of the Lord or we're going to read he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And into this 
Liston and record in this list we find Manasseh and what we read you know we don't really need to be told but verse 2 did tell us that he did evil in the sight of the Lord and you know there's something he is regarded as the very worst of all the Judean kings but you wouldn't have thought he was going to turn out like that you see Manasseh had all the breaks Manasseh's father was Hezekiah, a man who did right in the sight of the Lord. His mother was Hephzibah, okay? And Jewish history or Jewish historians, they, they say that she's a daughter of the prophet Isaiah. So early on, if, if you or I, if we'd been asked, you know, to kind of make a, a prediction about Manasseh, you know, he came from great stock, he had great genes, he would have had the, the very best of teaching, the very best of opportunity. And we could have been forgiven for, for thinking or predicting that he has been born into greatness and he's destined for the same himself. But that wasn't how it worked out. Manasseh was a bad man, however you look at it. Verse 11 tells us that his sins were worse than the Amorites who were driven out of the land. We read that uh, he, he undid all the good that his father Hezekiah had done. And you can read, by the way, what Hezekiah did in 2 Kings chapter 18, 3 to 7. He erected Asherah poles all over the place, even, even inside the temple. And you know, an Asherah pole, it was a pole or a tree that was set up to honour the pagan uh, kind of mother fertility goddess Asherah. And she was worshipped as the mother of heaven. And it was a place where the, the pagan worshippers, uh, where they sacrificed to her. Altars were built and erected to Baal, another pagan fertility god, sometimes seen as the, the, the kind of consort of Asherah. Again, inside the temple too. Verse 3, he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and, and served them. And all, all the hosts of heaven, by the way, uh, that, that means the, the, you know, the moon and the stars and so on. And among them, Moloch. A sun god. And the statue of Moloch was used for the sacrifice of newborns. And verse 6 tells us that Manasseh sacrificed his own son. Now listen, before I say this, this comes with a wee bit of a, a viewer discretion warning. What I'm about to say is, is graphic and it's brutal. But the statue of Moloch was, was that of a man with his two arms outstretched in front of him like this. And a fire was lit below the arms and they were heated up until they glowed. And then the newborn babies were placed in the arms. They were sacrificed by placing them in those arms. Still in verse 6 he, he used fortune telling and omens and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. Now most of those speak for themselves and you're well aware of what they are but just in case you don't know um, a necromancer is a, is a kind of a witch or a wizard or even a magician who has what is known as a familiar spirit. And guys, as, as I say, as I'm, I, I'm actually thinking to myself, am I speaking of today or back then? Because this sort of thing it has become so commonplace today. But this familiar spirit, this spirit guide as it might be called today, is actually demonic. They were demon-possessed. And those who thought, and those who think today, that they're actually communicating with the dead, they're conversing, they're communicating with the demonic. This is serious, serious stuff. He was a mass murderer. It says in verse 16, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. He was a mass murderer of the innocent. And again, Jewish historians would, would, would tell us that he was responsible for the death of his own grandfather, the prophet Isaiah. By having him sawn in two. And you know many scholars believe that um, in Hebrews 11.37 the inclusion of being sawn in two 
is in fact uh, referring to Isaiah. And then to top it all off, he led those under his rule to do the same. So listen, Manasseh. Manasseh didn't just kind of drift somehow in the wrong direction. And Manasseh didn't somehow, you know, fall, as we might say today, uh, you know, of someone who has slipped into ungodliness or ungodly behaviour. Manasseh really went for it here. I mean, he actively, deliberately, and with great enthusiasm and passion, broke every single commandment there was, and then some. This was all out rebellion against God. Now, I'm going to say that this has not been the most pleasant of reading. I'm sure you'll agree. Quite horrendous in some places, actually. And honestly, I'm glad that we've come to the end of it. But it is what is recorded in Scripture. And it's recorded for a reason. Which is why I've spent the time on it in this kind of unpleasant account of this man's life of Manasseh. And if we read on to the to the end of the account in, in 2 Kings, uh, as you might expect, the result was that he angered God. The result was that God punished him and punished those, by the way, who followed him too. And the last two verses in this uh, passage, they refer to, that's like a non-biblical account um, of the rest of the actions of Manasseh. And then we're told that he died, slept with his fathers, and he was buried in his own garden. It's a brutal account of arguably the most evil and the most brutal man ever recorded in Scripture. But, but, as I said, this is recorded in scripture for a reason and it's not just uh, to provide us with that chronological account uh, you know of, of the kings of Israel and Judah which it does if we look at the rest of the story of Manasseh which is actually not recorded here in two kings we're going to find what is perhaps one of the most grace filled hope-filled passages in the whole of the Bible. And this is where I really want to get us to today, even though we've had an unpleasant journey to get here. Turn, if, if you would, with me, please, uh, if you want to read along. Um, turn with me to the book of uh, Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 33. I'll let you find it for a second. Well, I got a, uh, a quick drink. We're going to begin in verse 10. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no attention. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the, the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria. He captured Manasseh with hooks. And bound him with chains of bronze. And brought him to Babylon. You know so far this is kind of similar to what we read in 2 Kings. But these next two verses. Oh boy these next two verses. They're two of the most powerful verses. You're going to find in scripture. When thinking of God's dealing with an individual. Verse 12. And when he, Manasseh that is, was in distress, he entreated or he sought or he cried out for the favour of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. What? Are we reading this right? 
I, this can't, this, this couldn't be true, could it? Look, let's, let's read it again from another version, just to make sure. But while in deep distress, Manasseh sought the Lord his God and sincerely humbled himself before the God of his ancestors. And when he prayed, the Lord listened to him and was moved by his request. So the Lord brought Manasseh back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh finally realised that the Lord alone is God. We see in this, guys, here we have one of the most evil men in scripture. A man who is actually comparable uh, to Adolf Hitler in, in so many ways. And believe me, he is. There, there, there's a long list of, of, of similarities between the two if you actually go into it. An evil, evil man. Brutal man. Yet what happens when he sincerely and genuinely repents before God? He's forgiven. And not only is he forgiven, but God takes him back to Jerusalem and gives him back his kingdom. Wow. Just wow. There is the grace of God poured out on Manasseh in abundance. Again, wow. You know, I did say that this was one of the most grace-filled and hope-filled passages in the whole of Scripture uh, when looking at God's dealings with an individual. And it is. This most evil of men was forgiven. Forgiven and restored. Restored, in a, 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 a restored to God and restored in his kingdom in Jerusalem in Judah. Wow. Well, Kind of hard to get our heads around it when you think of how evil he was, isn't it? Yet this is the grace of God, and that same grace is there for you and for me. If and if you're far from God today, if you've fallen away from God, and if you've been saying or or, or doing things that you know full well grieve or hurt the heart of God, or even if you have been living your life in deliberate, complete rebellion to God, there is hope. There's hope. Compare yourself to Manasseh the next time you think you've wandered too far. Think of Manasseh uh, when you consider uh, your rebellion against God. When you think of maybe that it has somehow prevented you from ever being restored to God. Think of Manasseh. Think of Manasseh, then think again. Because God can restore anyone who seeks him uh, with a true heart in true repentance, regardless of the person's past deeds or actions. If you come to God with a sincere heart of repentance, you will receive that same grace, that same love and that same mercy and forgiveness that Manasseh received, that countless others have received over the centuries and that many more are receiving and will receive from God. Listen to John 6.37 from the mouth of Jesus himself. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So there you have it. The cast iron guarantee from Jesus himself. And you know at the end of chapter 20 in, in John's gospel. Just before John kind of rounds off his uh, gospel account in the last chapter. Chapter 21. Right at the end of chapter 20. John tells us why he, he made the gospel account in the first place. John 20, 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples. Which are not written in this book but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name so that you may have life 
abundant life, eternal life in his name. And you know, that's another reason why Manasseh's story is recorded for, for us all to see and to read. It points the way to God. It points to God's grace. It points to the forgiveness that it's available. So even though this began as a pretty dark, uh, an unpleasant, a brutal story with God, God has stepped in and it has finished. And I'm going to say it again. as arguably the greatest story of God's grace when dealing with an individual ever recorded. It's a beautiful story. It's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful story of God's love and God's mercy. And that same love and mercy is available for you today if you would just come to God. Amen. I hope you've been blessed uh, and encouraged by this today. I hope I have a, a great week ahead. See you next week. God bless.